if you're looking at um, Intramuros from the perspective of history, it's one place where you could actually see the history of the Philippines uh, as it unfolded. Um, I see that um, Intramuros is a, an area which can embody the concept of reuse in urban planning. So just think of old structures being utilized in a modern sense. I think the challenge for us in IA is how can we recreate the former ambiance so that people can relive history um, through Intramuros and then that's where uh, it becomes a site where we can educate people on the version of history according to the Filipinos. So I am Roberto Alabado III and uh, currently I am the Assistant Secretary for Tourism Development Planning and it's fantastic to have an urban area, an old urban area, we're in the um, maybe in our generation we can see this transformed into a, or a more developed society where poverty will no longer exist within the walls of Intramuros. When I was studying here, and well, walking on the walls, around the walls, many things I discovered, while they are old, they were still of value. And that's a treasure for me, and that's a treasure for every Filipino who comes to Intramuros. From my elementary years up to my junior high school, I was a student of Letran. So that's 11 years of studying here in, in, in Intramuros. Also, I lived here in Intramuros. So, when I was elected director, uh, that was one of the things that uh, convinced me to accept the job. Because uh, Intramuros is not just a place that is distant, it's something very near to me, to my history, and well, to who I am right now. I am Father Clarence Victor Marquez of the Order of Preachers. I am the rector and president of Coleo de San Juan de Letran since the year 2015. However, Letran has been in Intramuros since the year 1620. So come the year 2020, we shall be celebrating our 400 years of existence within the walls of Intramuros. Letran continues to grow. In fact, we are looking towards the future in terms of expanding ourselves, putting up structures, of course, in, uh, out of respect and consideration of our current context, our local, we are in Intramuros. Nonetheless, we can contribute so much in building the present and the future of Intramuros and of Letran. Very many things here are still very relevant if we could only take time to appreciate them. We also have this reputation that, well, it's poor. Uh, we have so many poor communities around, but then it's not a matter of removing them, but empowering them. Uh, this, after all, continues to be a living community. It's about people. In the Muros, there are not just walls. It's about people who continue to live and struggle and have dreams and aspirations for the present and for the future. So all of us here who are in Tramuros and the rest of the Filipino people ought to contribute something in terms of keeping Intramuros relevant, helping us rise, and helping us, well, uh, live better lives for ourselves. IA's dedication ensuring that tangible treasures that immortalize our history are now accessible to the public is commendable. Congratulations to the Intramuros administration. I wasn't expecting 
that the collection can be so amazing. I was really, it was really an awesome experience seeing all of this collection. And it's like 30% only of the collection. I wish to see more. Again, congratulations. Sabi ko eh, ito yung malaking isang tagumpay kasi matagal namin naka, nakatabi yan, nakatago at hindi na i-display talaga sa public yan. Pangalawa, nagpalipat-lipat na ng location yan at ngayon, na-save natin. Ito mo rin sabi mahalaga para sa akin bilang Pilipino kasi maraming bagay sa Pilipinas dito nagsimula sa mga kasi. Well, actually, more than reviving the structure, talaga may tindihan ng tao kung anong kondisyon ng intramuros sa pagmulong ng Pilipinas. Kasi kung walang pagkilala, walang pagmahal, hindi siya mananatili. Fernando Shao si Tao, uh, Professor Emeritus sa Atene de Manila sa Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Ang mensahe ko lang, dapat mas mas nuanced, mas complex ang ating pagkakit sa kasaysayan. Kasi mahirap itong black and white eh. Uh, pagtingin sa kasaysayan. Masyado moralistic, mas nakastila, masama. Dapat, dapat mas, ano, mas three-dimensional ang pagtingin sa kasaysayan. It was a very exciting time, that's what I remember most. I was on a holiday and I got a frantic call. Where are you anyway? They have been looking for you. And I said, what about? Having a restoration force as big as Intramuros was at the time, well, didn't exist anywhere in the country. When we came into Intramuros to work, uh, what are we restoring? We do not know how did it look, except for the ruined walls. That's why we have to to dig pictures and pictures and pictures just to be able to to provide a background uh, and tell people this is important. This part of the walls look like this. Everything was something that came to us by a calling, you'd say, that we have to do it right. Intramuros is a beautiful memory of the past. It is like a microcosm of all things good and bad. There are many good stories about Filipinos, people who headed the construction of the walls, and they were Indios. The carvers were Filipinos also. That people should follow the regulations more, and that they should not seek exemption all the time. And this applies to both government church and private owners. I'm Esperanza Buna Gartonton. I was hired, I would say, I was one of the first employed in the Intramuros administration structure. And that was pretty, 1979. You have many people saying that Intramuros should not be preserved because it is a colonial memory and that should be erased. I don't think so. It represents failure. It represents achievement. So it's about time that our people should see Intramuros is not just a symbol of colonialization, but the symbol of our spirit to rise above that. I 
I'm uh, Martin Tino Jr. My Lolo became chairman of the Comelec, and he was the one who transferred the Comelec to Intramuros. I was in grade school. He would go home at 6 o'clock every afternoon. They pick us up at 4 o'clock, so I have to wait for him in his office. So I would go around Intramuros in the 19, early 50s. It was all ruins. I've always been interested in old houses. I began traveling throughout the whole country. Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. This is our history. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. IA was founded. And uh, Jimmy Laya, I didn't know Jimmy Laya. He got me as a consultant. Then we started having exhibits. Uh, the first ever on relieves, on santos, on ivory. We have all these horrible looking modern buildings. I wish they could tear it down and rebuild it properly. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. In the afternoon, Intramuros was empty. Empty. There was hardly any people. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people considering the problems we had in the beginning. They have thousands of people coming here and all of them are paying the entrance fees, restaurants, everything, all those calais. Can you imagine? It's alive. You can see the whole thing is alive. For me, Intramuros is our past, present, and our future. And because of that, it is very important in our lives. We must be involved and engaged in Intramuros. And we, as citizens, must do everything to keep it alive, to keep it vibrant, because it is the archive of our history. It is the archive of who we are as a people. I'm Olivia Limpeao. I'm the president and CEO of Distillery Limtuaco and the fifth generation master blender and distiller of the oldest distillery in the Philippines. So our company was established in 1852 and it was our founder is uh, Don Bonifacio Limtuaco who came from China, Fujian, China, and he introduced to the Philippines this product called Shok Hok Tong, which eventually became the generic term uh, for Chinese medicinal wine, Shok Tong. And so uh, we are very much part of the history of the Philippines through our liquor making with 167 years of history and legacy that we have shared with this country. Well, Intramuros is very important because this was really the seat of um, governmental power and uh, trade culture, religion, and we're very proud to be part of Intramuros now through our museum. While our role in Intramuros is really to provide another tourist spot, you know, another tourist spot where through our museum, tourists can learn more about our country, about our products, about our industry. And uh, we're very proud to be given that opportunity to participate, you know, in promoting culture through food. Well, I would really love
love that Intramuros would be teeming with tourists, with young people working in this place, celebrating our history and our culture, and sharing it with the rest of the world. Similar to what other countries are doing, for instance, like in Tallinn, Estonia, where they have a medieval, medieval walled city, I wish uh, our Intramuros would be not just like that, but maybe even better, you know? So it would be um, really a living walled city of the past, the present, and the future. Ang Intramuro sa akin ay mahalaga. Ito ay naniniwala ako. Ito lang ang Old Manila na siya ay nagpalago ng Metro Manila. Ito yung prime mover ng urbanization din ng Metro Manila. Kung wala yung Intramuro, wala yung Metro Manila. Kasi dito nagsimula yung malalaking eskwelahan, malalaking building, lahat ng opisina ng gobyerno. Ito lang ang uh, lugar na may, may walled city o ciudad murada na tinatawag. Kaya nandito yung mahalagang building, tao, saka ano, dito lumago. Pero no 1920 hanggang 1930, lumalabas na rin hanggang 1900, lumalabas na yung mayamang pamilya para magtayo ng malalaking bilya kasi masikip na rin yung Tamuros, mainit. Kailangan mag-expand mga, mga eskwelahan, lumabas na yung Tamuros. Tudad na ng UST, lumabas siya no 1927. Tapos yung mga iba pa, Ateneo de Manila, nasunog siya no 1932. Tapos lumabas din siya. Sana magpatuloy, tuloy-tuloy na maayos sa Intramuros. Pagdating ng present generation, maayos sa Intramuros na wala nang masyadong problema. Kasi sa ngayon may mga, may mga kakagipat pa rin problema. Nandiyan pa rin mga ibang informal settler na may, may narelocate na kami yung mga istansa. Siguro dadami pa ang turista sa atin kasi mabubuksan natin yung isa gitna. Tapos yung mga pavement, ayos. Tapos yung mga travel ng tao, foreigner ay mapapabilis kasi marami nagpapaliwanag. Sa ngayon, dumadami na. May bambike na, may e-trike, may kalesa na. Marami na nag-aano sa Intramuros kasi ngayon, eh, nag nagiging ano na to, parang tuwing may uh, Manila tour, laging Intramuros ang priority ng Department of Tourism Heritage. Ako nga pala si Mr. Reynaldo Cadiz, nagtatrabaho sa Intramuros ng almost uh, 40 years from 1979 hanggang, nine, hanggang ngayon. Naging restoration project, uh, inspector din ako sa Intramuros kasi lahat ng mga ginagawang restoration ay dinaanan ko from uh, stone cutting, tapos pagbubuho, proper document. Do, bago siya gawin, babaklasin muna namin yung mga lumang bato tapos papalitan namin, mga may crack na, papalitan namin ng bago. Misan, nung early part ng resto, uh, documentation namin, naglalagay din kami ng mga number sa bato para maibalik namin yung structure sa dating ayos. Napaka-importante sa Muros kasi ito yung buka, ito yung ano natin eh. So, sa, sa buhay ko napakahalaga to kasi da, dahil sa Intamuros sa uh, na dito ako nagtabaw ng 40 years, eh, naging tanungan ako ng mga pangyayari dito na bagamat hindi ko inabot iba, yung mga archaeology, tunnel na nahukay, mga art artifacts. Tinatanong ako, mga nahukay ng mass grave, halos lahat building na restore kung ano ba yung mga dating opisina dito ng pre-war. Kasi nagbasa din ako ng mga libro na about sa archives namin. Tapos yung mga old photo, napakahusay ko mag-identified kasi kabisado ko yung old photo and then in new yung pagkakaiba. Intramuros, isa sa pinakamahalagang lugar dito sa buong Pilipinas. Ito ay isa sa pinaka-historical place. Ay naituturo ng isang kutsero ay, ay may turo sa mga bawat na mga masyal kung anong mahalagang lugar dito sa Intramuros. Ang mga rule ng mga kutsero ay kailangan Uh, panatili, malinis ang lugar, tapos uh, mag-inupome, 
At sunod, sunod din ang mga alat-tuntunin ng intramuros. Dito sa intramuros, sana uh, sa araw o bawat sa linggo, bigyan nila ng uh, mga libre ng mga lugar para lalong pasyalan ng mga namamasyal dito sa Intramuros. Yung iba kasi uh, namamasyal dito, hindi nakakapasok sa mga lugar-lugar kasi may mga bayan. Ako po pala si Romeo M. Javier bilang isang kutsero at bilang isang tour guide sa Intramuros. Dito rin ako nabubuhay at nabubuhay ang aming pamilya. Kaya malaking, malaking tulong ang Intramuros sa buhay ng bawat isang kutsero din. Right. So we're about to start in two minutes. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us in this Intramuros learning session. So this is our 62nd episode. So we have a lot of uh, attendees. I see we have a lot of attendees from everywhere. Uh, we have... All over the country. All over the country and all over the world as well. We have one. Here we have... Uh, Manuel Perez from the Library of the Universidad de Extremadura in Spain. Hi. Hi. Mr. Manolo. <laughs> oh, you know each other? Yeah. Hi. So we have from Sorsogon, Garner Olaveri from Sorsogon. We have from the National Archives, so Miss Veronica Aniceto. Hello. Greetings. We have from Mera Vizcaya. Yeah. That's the advantage of having the online session, no? <laughs> Many participants can, can join. It becomes more inclusive, no? Mm -hmm. So let me just click this record button. Recording in progress. All right, so we shall start now. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you everyone for coming. <coughs> second episode of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. This is your host, Van Charcilia, and this episode is brought to you by the Intramuros Administration. Now, 
to start our webinar, let me remind you of the, of the usual. So if you are viewing via Zoom, we encourage feedback, we encourage questions, we encourage comments. You may raise all of them in the chat button below or in the question in the Q&A button below the screen. Or if you are viewing via Facebook Live, you can raise your questions or comments in the comments section below. Take note that only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate and a, and a feedback form will be emailed to you after the session. So a certificate will be sent to you after that. And note that this webinar is recorded and the recording shall be made permanently available in IA social media channels. Now, if you are viewing via Facebook Live and you, you would like to transfer to Zoom, you can still do so. The registration link is in our Facebook page. Right. To introduce our speaker for today, so for this episode of the Intermost Learning Sessions, we're going to have a topic on the Heritage Library Collection of the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas. And for today, we're going to have Diana V. Padilla, Diana v. Padilla who is the Assistant Chief Librarian of the UST Miguel de Benavides Library. She is a licensed librarian with a Bachelor of Science as well as a Master of Arts in Library and Information Science from the University of San Tomas. She started work at the UST Miguel de Benavides Library in April 2008 and was assigned to various library sections. In July 2008, she was appointed as interim secretary for the Lumina Pandit, a grand exhibit set up by the, uni by the university uh, during the 2011 quadricentennial celebrations. In 2011, she headed the library's digitization project. She also became the head librarian of the Antonio Vivencio de los Rosario USD Heritage Library from 2012 to 2017. And she received training from several international institutions to further expand her knowledge and experience. Ms. Padilla, as I said, is currently the Assistant Chief Librarian of the UST Miguel de Venus, Venus Library and is the librarian in charge of the Heritage Library of the University. Now, without uh, further ado, I'd like to call on Ms. Padilla for her presentation. Okay, thank you so much, John. I call you John or Rancho. And uh, I am so happy to be your guest speaker for this episode 62, which I will be talking about the USC Heritage Library, a timeless treasure. So let me just share my screen. I may. There you go. Can you see my slide, Rancho? Yes. All right. So, well, before I start, uh, first, I'd like to thank the Intramuros administration for inviting me to be the guest speaker. And thank you also to uh, the USD Miguel de Benavides Library Administrators for the support, uh, headed by our Prefect of Libraries, Father Angel Aparicio OP, and our Chief Librarian, Mom Cecil Lobo, and uh, Father Gaspar Segaya, our Assistant to the Prefect. So, and of course, the whole uh, UST Miguel de Benavides Library family as well. So, um, let me just um, discuss with you about the Heritage Library, its collections, the practices that we are doing, and um, the different uh, important collections that we have. So, maybe some of you are not familiar yet with the UST Heritage Library, especially now with the pandemic. Uh, nobody can visit the library physically, but uh, through this Intramuros administration uh, learning session, I would be able to share with you what we have in the USA Heritage Library. And also, this is a good opportunity uh, for me to share important information about our library. And this is also a good way to commemorate our 416th uh, founding anniversary of our library. We will be celebrating this by July 26. So uh, we'll be 416th already, no? So maybe some of you might ask why 416 for the library? And then the UST is only 410. So why is the library even older than the university? So perhaps um, our answer to that is, for us, the moment that uh, Father Miguel de Benavides, OP, the university founder, 
donated his personal library collection and a certain amount of 1,500 pesos to put up the college seminary. That's already the start of having the library in the university. That's why we are celebrating every July 26th. That's the death anniversary of Father Miguel de Benavides. So that's just a trivia for everybody. So um, to start off, let me just introduce to you my talk about the Miguel de Benavides Library. So some are maybe are still confused of the name of the central library in the university. It is called the Miguel de Benavides Library. Before it was named USD Central Library, but actually uh, it was only in August um, 11, 2006, that the USD Central Library was named Miguel de Benavides Library, just to commemorate the 400th death anniversary of our university founder. And it's also a nice way of presenting the legacy of our founder, Father Miguel de Benavides. That's why it's called Miguel de Benavides Library. And within the central building of the Library of USD, there's a section called Antonio Vivencio de Rosario USD Heritage Library. This is just a section within the Central Library of Miguel de Benavides Library. It is located at the fifth floor. So uh, the many, before we receive some uh, letters, no, uh, may we request to research at the U.S. Heritage Library? No, this is just a repository of historical rare collections of the university. But for the use of the entire collections of e-resources and other uh, recently published materials, it's through the Miguel de Benavides Library. Because the Miguel de Benavides Library caters to the academic needs of our students, more or less 40,000 students and our faculty members as well. And um, within this building, we are housing this important rare materials, which is located at the USD Heritage Library. Just to clarify those info. And the uh, Heritage Library, the establishment of this section is supported by a grant from the family of Ambassador Ramon V. del Rosario Sr. They donated a certain amount and uh, that amount was used to put up the section to improve the facilities and uh, house the important um, historical materials of the university. And it was named under their grandfather, Antonio Vivencio del Rosario, an outstanding Thamasian and the former Secretary General of UST in the 19th century. So the full name of the Heritage Library of the University is Antonio Vivencio del Rosario, UST Heritage Library. So we thank our library benefactor, the del Rosario family, for donate, donating a certain amount for us to put up the section. So the USC Heritage Library supports the vision mission of the Miguel de Benavides Library to be a leading academic information and research center of the Philippines for the local and international community. But in addition, we affirm that the main role of preserving the past through conservation and digitization of our historical resources would be done in the Heritage Library to promote excellence in teaching, research, and service to the nation and humanity in general. So the Heritage Library, as I said, is the depository of great historical bibliographic collections accumulated for the past 400, more than 400 years of existence. And uh, for us, the library, the Heritage Library is not just a, a building or a, a room which houses dusty, uh, musty, dilapidated old books. For us, the Heritage Library is a link between the past, the present, and the future. So the books that we have here are arranged according to century in our stock room. And these books remain witnesses to the growth and development of the Philippine nation. That's why these are very rare and treasured materials in the university. So in our stock room, um, there are steel shelves in the, the environment within. Uh, we monitor daily 
the temperature inside the room, the humidity level as well. We keep the 24-7 um, air conditioning unit. So, I mean, to maintain the, the temperature inside the stock room. And also to preserve the copies for during disaster, we have installed the fire suppression system. So it's a, a little bit expensive. Actually, it's very expensive to maintain all these books uh, from the electricity itself, the manpower, the maintenance of the facilities. So we really have to take a look into those as part of our preservation. So we have uh, more or less 30,000 volumes of rare materials such as books, maps, periodicals, uh, photos, and others. So these are some of the photos, the physical condition of our rare books. Uh, they might may be old, dusty, and um, sometimes smelly, no? but these are treasures, not just of UST, but treasures of the whole Philippine nation. They may be old, yes, but these contains important information. And many of the students in our university who graduated here, who became leaders, who became professionals, who contributed to the growth and development of our nation, have used all these materials. So as part of our facility in the Heritage Library, we have the Conservation Laboratory. This is where we do the restoration of books. And later on, I'll be giving you some details about the restoration work that we're doing. And then we have the reprographic area. This is where we do the scanning of books since we have this digitization project as well. And um, aside from that, the reprographic, we have this, uh, the receiving area wherein our researchers can only visit, physically visit the heritage library during the pre-pandemic. And the researchers uh, from off campus must have uh, a a letter of request before they can come because walk in we cannot walk in um, researchers we cannot accommodate right away no so there's a strict policy on that that a letter of request must be submitted first prior to the request and um, perhaps many of you are already familiar with the phrase lumina pandit the lumina pandit is a latin phrase which means spreading the light and um, this phrase is uh, widely known for UST Miguel de Benavides Library, particularly because um, it is an exhibit of historical collections that are found in the UST Heritage Library. So the Lumina Pandit, there was a grand exhibit of rare books. That was the first time when the UST Library um, exhibited its important rare and historical collections. And that was the project, the contribution of the USC Library in the commemoration of the quadricentennial anniversary of the University of Santa Tomas. Okay, why am I mentioning about this uh, Lumina Pandit? Because um, that was the time we were able to share what we have in a wider community, not just in USD, but in a wider scale. So maybe you are asking, why do we have to preserve rare materials. Like in the photos I showed you, those are dilapidated, those are dirty, those are, I mean, uh, dusty, no? Why train people to manage the section? Why do we have people to do the restoration work and do the scanning as well? Why spend so much for the section? You know, uh, just to share with you, uh, as for the fire suppression system that I, I mentioned a while ago that we placed inside our stock room, um, the cost of that is around three million, just to protect the section from fire. You know? Why do we spend so much for the section? Why? So these are the questions that maybe are coming into your mind. Why do you have to a lot money just for these old collections of books? Well, our answer for that is simply because. These books are treasures. These books remain the witness to the growth and development of the Philippine nation. So they are treasures of UST and of the whole Philippine nation. So, and that's what makes these important collections of UST as a, for us a national cultural treasure 
that must be preserved. So this is an example of a stack of books from Benavides collection. So I'll be in the next slides. I'll be showing to you some of the important um, books that we are keeping in the heritage collection. As I said, we have about thirty thousand volumes of rare books, but I have just selected some uh, just for this presentation. So this is an example of a stack of books from Benavides collection. So imagine in the time of sixteen o five when Father Miguel de Benavides OP donated his personal collection. So up to now, we still have some of his books in our heritage library, still intact. Though need of preservation, but then the books are still there. So such a treasure that we have to keep. So this is our father, Miguel de Benavides OP, the founder of UST, who became also the Archbishop of Manila. Then an important book that we are keeping is La Guerra Judaica. It's about the Jewish war, published in 1492. It was dedicated to Queen Isabella and printed in Spain in the year which Columbus discovered America. So this is an example of Incunabula in the UST library. So when we say Incunabula, these are the books printed before 1501. Okay, so imagine that before 1501. And this book was published 1492. And the copy is still there in our library. So just to share with you a photo of this. And um, yeah, this is this. Uh, I think when I checked this in our World Cat before, and I couldn't find any copy in the, the world, uh, only here in USC. But I, I think now maybe some of copies of these are already available, also available in other libraries. But I still have to check on that. So again, this is one of the precious uh, books that we are keeping, published in 1492. Then another treasure that we have is the Biblia Sacra, or also known as the Polygot Bible, printed by Christopher Plantin. Plantin was the, one of the most eminent of 16th century printers. And, you know, this Polyglot Bible is very precious because uh, this is printed in several languages. So there's a language of Latin, Syria, Hebrew, Greek, no? And Plantin printed eight volumes. And luckily, in USA Library, we have five volumes out of eight in fairly good condition. Then we have a book by Nicholas Copernicus published in 1543 about the revolutions of the celestial bodies. This is from the first edition. When the book appeared in 1543, Copernicus was dying. And indeed, he saw the published work for the first time on the day of his death. It's another precious material that we are keeping. The copy is in good condition, but uh, we haven't restored it yet. Just like the Laguerra Judaica, because we need experts to help us uh, restore this kind of materials. Then we have this compendium, Manualis de Vary. So this is the, the handbook of Petrus Guevara, published in 1597. Actually, I have a story about this book because years ago, there were two Japanese researchers who came to USD Library. They were looking for this, no? And then I said, uh, what's the significance of this? Uh, they said that um, they couldn't find a copy of this in Japan. And they need this for their publication. They came all the way from Japan just to take a look of the actual copy that we have and then requested for, requested for a copy of the title page and a, uh, another copy of some of the pages there for their publication. So imagine how precious this copy is for them. So we are also, the librarians like me, no? we are also learning from our researchers because our collections are written in several languages. Majority are in Spanish, others in Latin, Hebrew, Greek, you know? and uh, we do not understand all these languages that are in our rare collection. So we also learn from our researchers when they come. They would say, yeah, this is very important in our history. This is important in the history of the Jesuit missions in Japan. And this is the only copy available, something like that. So when we learn that those information from our researchers, 
and uh, yeah, we we get the significance of the books that we are having here. So it makes us very um, proud that oh yes, USC Library has this. Okay, we have this, but we have to do something to still preserve the copy for the use of the future generation. Then another uh, important jewel in our library is the Doctrina Cristiana in uh, Spanish and Tagalog. No? This was printed in 1593 through a xylographic method, meaning using a wood block. So uh, before they had to carve each letter on the wood before they can print uh, a page. So the facsimile copy of this uh, a Doctrina Cristiana we have here in USC Library, but the original copy of this is in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The digital copy is also available in their website if you want to take a look at it. But this facsimile copy, we, we were able to scan it and it's already available in our digital library website. Next is the Doctrina Christiana in Chinese, so another important jewel that we have. The original copy of this is in the Vatican Library. It's just so unfortunate that this um, import, uh, first books published in the Philippines back in 1593, we do not have the original copy here in the Philippines. And, um, but at least we have the facsimile copy that we were able to show you and also on display in our Heritage Library. So going back to this Doctrina Christiana in Chinese, the original copy is available at the Vatican Library. And um, since I mentioned about the Lumina Pandit project, wherein uh, we were able to display our rare book collections back in 2011, 2010 to 2011, we tried borrowing this Doctrina Christiana in Chinese in the Vatican Library just to show the Filipinos the, the first book printed, no? like the Doctrina Christiana in Spanish, Tagalog, and Baybayin text as well. But then, because of the expensive fee from the insurance itself, we had, I think that time, as part of the contract, we have to pay like 3 million pesos just to borrow that book and be brought here back in Manila for an exhibit. So imagine the amount of money that they put in this book. So meaning, they really care about the book. They give importance to the book. And they don't want that something wrong would happen to the book. That's why they, they assured that, okay, somebody from the Vatican Library would be coming together with the book. He'll be the first person to touch it and put it in the display case, something like that. So that's part of their policy. So they give so much importance to this. So um, on the other hand, we're, we're happy to know about that, that these people from the Vatican Library give uh, extra care for our important uh, publication, the Doctrina Christiana. Then we have another jewel published in 1593, the Shilu. The, this is a more comprehensive type of Doctrina Christiana. The original copy of this is in the Spanish National Library in Madrid. So another book that we are keeping, the Noli Metangere published in Berlin in the year 1886. The USC Library has a copy of the first edition in good condition with some torn pages. This is the famous novel of Jose Rizal, translated Touch Me Not, published in 1887, but on the page of dedication to his country, it was done in Europe in 1886. The copy is of the original binding and used to belong to a certain Vicente Mills. Then we have, of course, the El Filibusterismo, the continuation of the Noli Metangere. This was published in 1891 by Jose Rizal. The, it also carries a notation of Jose Rizal dedicating the copy to his classmate and friend, Fernando Canon. Faustino on 17th of September, 1891. So the, the, our copies are still in good condition with some torn pages and the binding similar to the original. So we, we keep these materials very well and uh, we've scanned them already. So you may see them through our digital library, by the way. 
Then another important collection, the El Tricentenario. So this is a memento when the University of Santo Tomas celebrated its 300 years for the uh, founding anniversary. So on our end, uh, we were able to have our own, also our publication in the commemoration of the quadricentennial of UST for the 400 years. So we had the tricentenario and then we also had for the 400 years. So that's called the Lumina Pandit. No? We had an exhibit, but then after that, <laughs> we were able to publish a book, a memento of that event, the Lumina Pandit, a collection of historical treasures. Okay, the Arte de la Lengua Visaya de la Provincia de Leyte, published in 1663. So this is an example of a, <clears throat> a grammar book, grammar books or dictionaries. We have several here in USD Library. And according to one of the researchers here, no, Ms. Uh, Dr. Jorge Mojaro, he said that this book is the only copy available in the world. Wow. So imagine the... <clears throat> Imagine the, the pressure also on our end. Well, this is the only copy and we have to preserve this. And uh, so that other people would be able to use it in the future for their research. So this is not the only Arte de la Lengua book that we have. We also have the Grammatica Latina, Arte de la Lengua Tagala, Immanuel Tagalog. We also have the Vocabulario de la Lengua Bicol, Diccionario Ibanag Español. So we have several of these uh, vocabularies and dictionaries in our heritage library. When I was um, discussing about this with our prefect before, uh, why do we have so many dictionaries here, you know, uh, written in several Philippine languages, translated into Spanish? And then he explained to me, uh, these books were used to educate the Filipinos, to evangelize them as well. And it took uh, a while to finish a dictionary, for instance, because uh, for a certain word, the missionary had to interview at least seven people to get the true meaning of a certain word and be translated to Spanish. So imagine the, the bulk of work uh, that was done before these books can be printed. Then another important uh, collections of the Heritage Library is the, of course, the set of rare periodicals we have. Just to share with you some, we have the Libertas. This is a daily a newspaper published by the University of Santa Tomas. And uh, we have from 1901 until 1918, the last uh, year, no? the, the last issue came out on January 31, 1918. So this is the first daily Catholic newspaper in the country and the first newspaper in the world published by a university during that time. Then Ang Kalayaan, we have in our collection from 1912 to 1914. And this is one of the vernacular newspaper published in 1912 and was the weekly organ of the Catholic community edit, edited by Perfecto Gabriel. Then we have official Gazette or Gazeta Oficial. We have the Gazeta Oficial. Uh, this is um, an organ of the government, uh, the official publication of the government. And uh, we have from 1902 up to 1945. These are the first um, early issues of the Gazeta Oficial. And then the 1946 up to the present times, we are keeping in our civil section at the third floor. Okay. And then uh, we are starting to upload the Gazeta Oficial in our digital library website. But it takes time because uh, each issue um, we have to do the metadata and it takes a while to finish each, you know. And then we also have El Ilocano. So El Ilocano is a bilingual newspaper whose purpose is to bring science to the common people. We have a collection of El Ilocano from 1889 up to 1890. And it contains articles on Ilocos history, geography, law, letters from the Pope, church, agriculture, and there is also a section in El Ilocano dedicated to women. 
Okay, so since, uh, as I've said, we have about 30,000 volumes of rare collections in USC Library, so for us to inform our target researchers of what we have, we were able to publish this catalog of rare books. So we have this uh, volume one from 14 books published from 1492 up to 1600. This uh, blue catalog is the uh, catalog of our Filipiniana rare books published from 1610 to 1945. Then the green one, this is the catalog of our 17th century rare books. Then we have this newly published catalog of rare books, 18th century. We have 19th century. The last one is the Filipiniana rare periodical. So these uh, catalogs have been very useful to our researchers. And uh, it, it's like the arrangement of our stockroom by century because it's so easy for the librarians and also for the researchers to locate the book that we have. Then just to uh, also market the catalog of our archives, since uh, both of the departments, library and archive, share the same mission of preserving this important historical materials that we have in the university, the USD archives um, was able to publish these two catalogs, the Beceros, Polietos, and Libros, and the catalog two is about Libritos. All right, um, going back to Lumina Pandit uh, exhibit, this was the first step of um, sharing to our public the important collections that we have. First is through Lumina Pandit exhibit. And luckily, by the divine providence as well, you know, Lumina Pandit exhibit gave the way to another important project uh, with our library benefactor the Union Bank of the Philippines. Because through Lumina Pandit, we were able to get a grant of uh, millions to support our important projects that we need to do to preserve our important treasures that we are keeping in both library and archives. So before the Lumina Pandit, maybe um, the... Maybe the participants here were able to visit the exhibit before, back in 2010, which ran until January of, or March of 2011. So this was the exhibit then. It was a big event you know, to commemorate the 400 years of UST. Okay. And as I've said, the Lumina Pandit catalog. So from Lumina 1, why do we have now the Lumina 2? It's because through this Lumina Pandit catalog also. This was um, the copy landed to the hand of our CEO, um, Union Bank of the Philippine CEO, Mr. Justo A. Ortiz. And through that, we were able to have this project with them, the Lumina Pandit 2, a sustainable partnership program between the University of Santo Tomas and the Union Bank of the Philippines. Through this book, he got an idea of what important treasures that we are keeping in the university. And for him and the whole Union Bank um, people, that these materials should be preserved for centuries. These are important materials, not just for UST, but for the Philippine nation as well. So the Lumina Pandit 2, the MOA signing, was done April 28, 2011, just in time for the um, 400 years of UST. Mm -hmm. Through, uh, it was done here at the UST Miguel de Benavides Library. So under Lumina Pandit 2, there are three major components that the Union Bank of the Philippines, another benefactor, uh, that they'd like us to focus on. First is on the conservation, then we have the digitization and the publication of the catalogs. So the catalogs I already mentioned to you, but for the conservation and digitization, I will be showing you what we are doing as of now. Okay, so under the 
Lumina Pandit, the main focus is to conserve and digitize the materials of the Heritage Library, the ones in our stockroom, the important materials there, and the ones of the archives. Okay, so this is our UST archives. There. So those are arranged by boxes. They have a different arrangement compared to the Heritage Library. But um, on the conservation side, the main focus is really to restore this kind of materials that we are keeping. No? Not to make it uh, good as new, but to repair the, the page, remove the stain on each page, uh, patched in the holes with the warm eaten holes on each page, and try to keep it uh, and look good after the restoration and we need to sustain to sustain this and uh, we have to preserve this for years no? so imagine how dilapidated uh, some of our books in the heritage library and part of the conservation component we have to restore this and make it uh, look good still okay so in the restoration we we follow about 20 steps before we can finally restore a book. It starts with the physical assessment. And it, uh, the whole uh, restoration team is headed by my colleague, Ma'am Ginaline uh, Santiago, our head book uh, restorer. And then we also have our uh, staff helping her with the whole restoration process. But as of now, uh, since the pandemic is uh, here, we cannot uh, do the restoration on a regular basis. No? So again, going back to the restoration of books, about 20 steps to follow before we can finally restore a book. Imagine the, how tedious this kind of work is. And now luckily, with the help of our library benefactor, the Union Bank of the Philippines, we're able to do this through the use of machines. And like before, we had to do it manually. So in our restoration of books, it takes us now one month to finish a book. Before, when we didn't have the right equipment, it took us about three months to finish one book. Okay, just to show you some of our equipment that we have, we have this suction table to humidify the cover of our rare publications. Uh, some of them are bound in vellum, it's made of animal skin. So sometimes the cover is a bit crispy already and uh, we need to humidify it. And uh, once it is under the suction table, it becomes soft and we can still stretch the cover and finally restore it and make it still use as the cover after the restoration of the whole uh, copy of the book. Then we have the spirabilia. This is like a vacuum cleaner book cleaning machine for the book. This is a tedious work also as part of the conservation work, the preventive conservation as we call it. Because when you do the cleaning of the book, you have to do it page by page of cleaning. You know? So imagine if, how thick the book is. It, 1,000 pages, so you have to brush it 1,000 times as well. But you have to do it gently. And we are using not just an ordinary brush, but soft uh, brushes. No? And then we have the laboratory refurbishment. We have the sink here, and then uh, the water supply system is okay. And we have this leaf casting machine. This machine is really helpful for us because this helps us to patch in the holes uh, of each page of the book, okay? Okay, so here are a sample of our restored books, the before and after the restoration. This is the Libro de la Anatomia del Hombre. So before the restoration, it looks like this, very brown page with stain. And then now after the restoration, it looks better now. And then the, the stain was removed. The, the copy is okay. It's whole one page now. 
And then another portion, the before and after, no? So as you can see, there's a tissue already here to make it one whole page. And like here, there's a missing uh, portion. Then after the binding, it looks like this now. See, the cover has been cleaned, humidified as well, no? Okay, the before restoration and then here with the proper binding as well, no? You can see the difference. Okay, so we're done with the conservation. Now let's move on to the digitization. So this is a second component of the Lumina Pandi 2 project with the Union Bank of the Philippines. So for the digitization, the main um, goal for this is first to increase the accessibility of our historical materials. Second, we'd like to preserve the copy, you know, instead of giving to the researcher the actual copy that we have in the heritage, why not, you know, access our digital copy online. Then third, as I kept on saying, these important collections that we are keeping is not only for USD, but for the nation. Thus, we want to share what we have to a wider community through the digitization project. So we keep on saying that the library is the heart of every academic institution, modern libraries for modern users, and the place without boundaries. Now, we are doing this. We want to share what we have to a wider community. That's why through the digitization project, we have created our trusted digital uh, depository of these important collections in which our users, anywhere you are, from Mindanao, Visayas, or Luzon, or any parts of the world, from Spain, New York, etc., you would be able to access our important collections anytime, anywhere, as long as you have a good internet connection. So these are some of the materials we digitize. Rare books, Filipiniana collections, maps, photos, even the grades of our national heroes. So for the digitization aspect, it's not only the heritage library materials are being scanned and uploaded to our digital library website. It's also the archives collections are also there in that website. So we can reach a wide range of people who are very much interested in historical research. So this is really a gift for everybody. So building a library for tomorrow, and that's with what we are doing in the heritage library and then the archives as well. So for the component of the digitization project, before you could start with this, there are requirements that must be met. The digitization project, honestly, is a very complex endeavor because it takes a lot of uh, commitment, manpower as well, a lot of um, dedication in order to push through with this. And it needs a lot of money. <laughs> Funding is also important for this one. Though our prefect of libraries would tell us, you know, money is not a problem. Okay, money is not a problem. As long as you have a very good project, money will come. You know? So that's what happened on our end. We did a very good project of the Lumina Pandit exhibit back in 2010 to 2011. And then that project became a, a seed for us to have this Lumina Pandit too, because many people like the CEO of Union Bank then, Mr. Huso A. Ortiz, noticed the significance of that exhibit and of our collection as well. That's why we're so um, grateful to Union Bank of the Philippines for giving us the opportunity to come up with this kind of projects, the conservation, the digitization, and the publication of our historical collections. 
So as I've said about the digitization, these are the project requirements. First, you must have a book scanner, a very good book scanner with a trusted software. You also be needing the storage servers to keep all the scanned materials inside these servers. Then manpower is also important because without manpower, your project would be, I mean, it would take time. Uh, imagine the number of books that we need to scan in a day. Uh, during the pre-pandemic, our target is really to scan about 2,000 pages of books. Uh, that depends on the physical condition. If the copy is in good condition, it's so easy for, for us to do the scanning. But if the copy is, uh, poor, is in a poor condition, of course, our um, manpower, our staff, must be very careful in doing the scanning. Otherwise, the copy might be destroyed. No? And then we have this digital management software. What is this for? This is a digital management software allows us to organize, manage, and upload our digital collections through the digital library website. So this is uh, also very costly. And uh, maybe some of you might ask, no? but there are already um, free software available in the internet. Yes, there are several softwares available, but for us, we want a trusted digital management software. So in case uh, something wrong happens to it, we have a, a, a supplier or a vendor whom we can communicate with about this, okay? So this is a license, a digital management software, the Content DM. Okay, so this is our homepage. The, uh, you may access our digital library through the digilive.ust.edu.ph. And here, our digital library is divided into three major collections. First, we have the historical, the current publications, and then the archival. So under historical, there are several subdivisions still, no? We have collection one, the first university collections. These are the books of our university founder, Father Miguel de Benavides OP. The other uh, donors like Captain Hernando de los Rios Coronel and Father Diego de Soria OP. There's another collection called the Collegiate Collection. It contains books on theology, religion, philosophy, scriptures, dogmatic theology, etc. Then we also have a collection about law. Collection four is about the medicine. Collection five, this is the most frequently used uh, digital books in our website, the Filipiniana Rare Materials. We also have the Filipiniana Thesis and Dissertations. We have the books about Dominicans and UST. We have rare periodical publications, just like uh, what I showed you a while ago, the Kalayaan, um, Gazeta Oficial, El Ilocano, those things, and then some of our photographs. Another major subdivision is the current publication. So it contains the university publications, the major university publications, the Acta Manilana, Ad Veritatem, Bulletin Ecclesiastico, Antoninus Journal, etc. Filipiniana Sacra, Tomas, UNITAS and our University Heritage Catalogs, plus some books printed by our UST Publishing House. So these are current materials. We also included this because uh, it would be helpful for our researchers and it's a good collaboration between the Publishing House and the UST uh, Publications Editors. And it's part of our history in the university. That's why we also like to keep the digital copy of this. No? Next is the archival. So this is under the office of uh, Sir Professor Regalado Trota Jose. No? They have uh, several subdivisions. The collection one is about libros, beseros, folletos, 
libros de matrículas de segunda enseñanza, libros de matrículas de facultad, about internment camp. We also have some collections. The collection 8 is about libritos. Okay. Okay, let's try to navigate this. This is as simple as um, navigating our online public access catalog. Let's try the collection 5, which is the Filipiniano materials. No? Okay, by clicking that button, you will be led to this page. Just click on Browse. Then, there's another way of doing the searching for all the collections we have in there in the digital collection. Just go to Browse button and then click Browse All or by Category. In the search box here, you may just key in the title of the book, a keyword, the name of the author, even just the first name or, or just a surname. Just key in there. Okay. Example. A Synod of Manila. Let's try if we have some materials about Synod of Manila before. So just key in there. And then once you key in Synod of Manila, these are some of the materials uh, that tackle about Synod of Manila. Just choose one. For example, the first book, Suma de Una Junta. No? So it talks about also the Synod of Manila. The pages of this material are located at the right side of the screen. Okay. And then you may also uh, click the page flip view to allow you to view the material electronically. Below that, we have the metadata here to make the, the material searchable. So this is being done by our librarians. They give the description of this material, this particular material, in order for it to be searchable. So see all the blue uh, texts here? These are searchable texts. No? And some information also to help um, the researcher to know more about this book. So this is a sample of a scan copy of this book about Synod of Manila. This belongs to the archives. Okay, so you would see this image once you search this through our digital library. So they have their own watermark at the side for the people to know this belongs to USD archives. Okay, it's very clear. The uploading that we're doing here, we, we use the PDF file. Okay, but the raw file or the mother file we keep the JPEG. Okay. Let's try another search. This time it's about Rizal Jose. No? Just key in this name in our, in our search box button. And then click enter. And then these are the materials to talk about Jose Rizal. No? So let's just choose one. For example, this. The Noli Metangere, the one I showed you a while ago. So for you to see the, the copy of this, just click this, okay, and then you will be led to this page. So again, the pages of this book are located at the right side. You can just uh, view it by scrolling down. And then for you to have a clearer view of each page, okay, this is the metadata information about Noli Metangere. Okay. To have a clearer view of this, go to page flip view, and then you will be led to this. Okay. So this allows you to electronically flip the page. Okay. So even the blank pages of the book are included because we do the scanning from cover to cover, including the spine of the book, to properly document the exact copy of our rare material. Okay, 
So we have our own uh, watermark in a slanted position to tell, again, the public, this belongs to USD Library. So our digital library is really for viewing purposes. You don't need to come here to see the actual copy. If the title is already available in our digital library, then anytime you can view it yourself. No? You can also zoom in and zoom out the page for a clearer view. Okay. Another example uh, about St. John Paul II. Let's try what, we, what uh, materials we have in our digital library. Okay, so these are mostly Bulletin Ecclesiastico de Filipinas, uh, one of our major USD publications. No? So these uh, samples we have here, after typing John Paul II, you will be led to this page. Just choose one. For example, the first one. Okay. So again, same thing. The pages of this volume, this is volume uh, 71 in 1994, or 95, sorry. So the pages are here. And for the USC publications, all the contents, all the contents in this uh, particular volume are encoded under the metadata of the digital library. So each keyword here, or the title of each article in this volume would be searchable, okay? So it's like indexing as well, no? In, in which uh, if you key in only a keyword, you will be led to this particular volume. Okay, so again, these are the pages of this particular uh, issue or volume. And that's it. No? Okay. The copy is in PDF as well, and it's very clear. And uh, in case that um, you need a high-resolution copy of an image, let's say the Noli Metangere, you need a, a, a high-resolution copy of the title page for your publication, you have to inform us because um, there is a minimal charge for that to help us generate funds also to sustain our digitization project. So if you need a high resolution copy, just uh, let us know. The policies and guidelines are also um, uploaded in our digital library website. So all the university heritage catalogs, including the archives, these are some of our heritage catalogs, the archives here, are also uploaded for your reference. Okay, there you are. Even our very precious uh, Lumina Pandit books, the two volumes, are also uploaded here. By the way, about the conservation and then the digitization practices, here in our USD library, um, there's a chapter in the Lumina Pandit, a continuum in this particular book in chapter four, you would be able to see our uh, articles about the conservation and the digitization aspect of the library. So it's very helpful um, in case you would be putting up your own conservation laboratory or if you would be doing your own digitization project in your respective libraries. Okay, as for our policies and guidelines, as, as I've said, it's in our digital uh, library website, just came here. And uh, you will be guided on this one. So again, if you would like to request for a better copy or high resolution copy of a page from our rare book, just click on the request form. There you go. So for the charging, for the high resolution copy, we charge 200 pesos per page. So this is uh, a minimal charge for a publication, for a picture to be used in your publication. And at the same time, you're also helping us to generate funds to continue to sustain uh, this um, important endeavor, the digitization project. Since, as I've said, it's a very costly project and it's not all the time that we have um, we have benefactor to help us out. So in our own little way or through the, the help of our researchers also, we are generating funds to support this project in the next years to come. Okay, 
So for the other publications are also policies and guidelines, especially with our current uh, UST publications, Acta Manila, na Tomas, about the thesis. By the way, in the thesis, we are not uploading the whole copy of the thesis and dissertations because of the copyright um, consideration. We are only uploading uh, uh, 10 to 15 pages of the thesis, which includes the title page, the abstract, the table of contents, the references. So for these uh, current USC publications, we had an agreement with the different editors on what um, portion of, the, of their materials can be uploaded. Others allowed us to upload the whole copy or the whole volume. Others, like the thesis and dissertations from the, our USC graduate school, they told us only these particular pages can be uploaded. And uh, for example, in the USC publishing house, only the cover, the title page, and the copyright page are, are allowed to be uploaded in our website. So communication is very important with our uh, partners uh, to avoid problems in terms of the copyright. Then this whole thing would not be really possible, would not have been successful, of course, without the help of our USD librarians and staff. You know, we've been working on this since 2011, the conservation, digitization, the publication of our um, rare materials through the Lumina Pandit 2 program. And since then, we've been very, our whole library family has been very helpful in order to sustain things. So now um, we're very much um, happy to share with you what we have accomplished, our digital library website, the conservation practices that we are doing, even the publications of our catalogs. We are sharing them with all of you. So these, um, let me just end my presentation by just saying that the conservation, the digitization, and the publication project components under the Lumina Pandit 2 and the, all the things that we are doing in the Heritage Library has been, we're very much grateful to our library benefactors, not just, of course, the Union Bank of the Philippines, the Del Rosario family, and other library benefactors, even before the Toyota Foundation, the ASID, etc. We're very, very grateful to them because they've been our partners to spread the light of knowledge and wisdom, not just the, to the Tumasian community, but also to a wider community. This project has taught our project team to be more committed, to be more passionate and dedicated to continue the mission of spreading the light of knowledge and wisdom to the nation and to the wider community. The Lumina Pandit 2 is really a gift that we are very grateful for. This is a gift that um, requires us to be more passionate and we need to treasure this, a timeless treasure that we must consider. The wisdom of the centuries that must be preserved, transmitted and expanded is placed under the librarian's care. This was mentioned by Reverend Father Rolando V. De La Rosa O.P., our former rector then, in 2011. No? This is a challenge for us, UST Library, and the librarians and staff as well, to continue the preservation of these important collections. And these must be preserved in the next years to come. These are, again, not just for UST, but this belongs to the whole Filipino nation, because this is our treasure, the cultural heritage treasure. This is part of our identity as Filipinos. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Padilla. Thank you for that uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, it was really inspiring to see the efforts of the university. Uh, Mr. John, um, just to wrap up everything about the Heritage uh, Library, about the presentation I made, I, I prepared this, um, I mean, the whole library, no? This is our uh, video 
right. for, about the heritage library. So sometimes there are big group of uh, people coming over to see the heritage library, but because of the limitation in space, we cannot allow accommodate all of them. So instead, our library has created this video just uh, for the big group so that they would still have an idea to, to about the Heritage Library by watching this video. So now uh, I am um, very happy to share with you, especially those who haven't seen the Heritage uh, Library, but for you, Mr. John, no, you, you've been to the library several times already, so you're familiar. But for others who might be interested to visit our Heritage Library after the pandemic, um, Please uh, watch this uh, video so you would learn more about the details of the preservation or the conservation plus the digitization efforts that we are doing. equipment 
and is comprised of two sections. The wet area, where the restoration and preservation of rare materials are undertaken, and the dry area, where the bookbinding, encasing, and encapsulation of maps are carried out. There is also a drying room for wet paper or pages after the washing procedure in the restoration of books. The Reprographic Area This is where the imaging operation is done. It is equipped with appropriately installed book scanner, digital camera, and computer units. Photocopying and laminating machines are also housed there. To lengthen the life of the library's precious collections, proper storage is provided to a suitable and clean staff room. Appropriate lighting, controlled temperature and humidity, and restricted access of personnel. The Heritage Library aims to prolong the life of these timeless treasures through its major activities the Conservation and Preservation Program, and the Digitization Project. The structure, the material, and chemical composition, the visual appearance, as well as the historical and cultural value of the books, are all taken into account. The library, with the valuable assistance of pioneer Filipino restorer, Ms. Maria Bernardita Marunilia Reyes, has designed a manual of restoration according to international and local standards. Restoration is a treatment procedure executed by a well-trained staff. It intends to return the book to its assumed original state through the addition of non-original materials. Six voluminous catalogs of rare books 
dated from the 15th century until the 19th century, including Filipiniana rare books up to 1945, and a catalog of Filipiniana rare periodicals that covered the beginnings of journalism in the Philippines until 1945. Two other books have been published by the library, Lumina Pante, a collection of historical treasures to commemorate the university quarry centennial, and Lumina Pande, a continuum, to highlight the continuous service of the Miguel de Benavides Library through its 400 years of history. The library receives distinguished visitors from the University of Santo Tomas, such as heads of state, cardinals, ambassadors, historians, writers, faculty members and students of various universities here and abroad. The Heritage Library collections stand as privileged witness to the emergence of the Philippines into nationhood through the last centuries. Our collective image would be incomplete without the ideas, knowledge and wisdom embedded in these books. Thus, the Antonio Vivencio del Rosario USG Heritage Library is committed to the preservation of the past through conservation, digitization, and effective management of its rich historical resources. It is our vision to contribute to the promotion of excellence in teaching, research, and service to the nation and humanity by spreading the light of knowledge and wisdom to succeeding generations. The Miguel de Benavides Library gratefully acknowledges the generosity of the family of the late Ambassador Ramon Vivencio de Rosario Sr., Union Bank of the Philippines, courtesy of Mr. Justo A. Ortiz, Chairman and CEO, and Ms. Maria Gonzalez Gulsi, Changqing Ku Foundation, Toyota Foundation, Agencia Española de Cooperación Internacional para el Desarrollo, National Commission for Culture and the Arts, and the University of Santo Tomas. Okay, so, well, uh, again, our... The, U the UST library and, of course, the archives are very much grateful to our uh, benefactors for allowing us to do such Im an important project, the Lumina Pandit 2 program, and uh, the rest of our uh, preservation activities that we're doing. And it's a wonderful gift to us, honestly. But now, uh, since everything is already set, we have our conservation laboratory, we have published several catalogs and also we have our digital library website. This is also our way of sharing this timeless treasure to our fellow Filipinos and to a wider community in general. So this is a really an effort on the part of our benefactors, our whole library team and the archives as well. So with that, we thank you and we hope that uh, you would be able to um, visit and um, learn from our collections, those that are available in our website. And uh, in case you have questions about the, the practices that we're doing, our collections, please, um, you may just visit our library website and you may send us an email through library at usd.edu.ph. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Padilla. That is indeed a very interesting presentation. It is truly inspiring to see the efforts of the university in the preservation and the promotion of the rare book collection, especially in the digitization program. How wonderful it is as well to see that the university has copies of several incunabulum as well as other world history changing publications, such as the Bible Sacra, the Book of Copernicus, among others. And as what Alicia Esguera, one of our attendees, have said, the maintenance 
expenses as a price, yes. But the collection is priceless. It is an accumulation of almost five centuries of record of knowledge, a national treasure and cultural heritage indeed. But aside from the intrinsic value of the rare book collection, it is also important to note that the collection itself has a contribution and significance to nation building as well. As you have said earlier in your discussion, hence why the collection is truly a uh, heritage, is truly a treasure for the Filipino people. Now, in your experience working with the library at the University of Santo Tomas, what for you is the most, uh, in your experience in the maintenance, in the preservation and the conservation of your rare book collection, what for you was the most rewarding experience? Well, on the rewarding side, uh, whenever our part of our collections are being published, when our researchers here and abroad would request a copy of the book and they'd like to research on, and they'd like to see and read the copy, going to the Heritage Library, publishing a certain picture for their book, and also by just knowing that the people are aware that our library has these important collections that's part of our uh, history. Yeah, that's a rewarding experience. Thank you for that. Several of our uh, audience, several of our attendees are asking uh, how to access the collection. Now, this was already addressed in the presentation. In order for you to access the collection, you may browse the website the steps are there the fees are there but uh, uh for this uh question and answer portion now what uh miss padilla is your tip for first-time researchers to the heritage library okay but um first about the collections in the digital library you know it's not all of our collections are in there because what we for the books what we uploaded there are those books published from 1920 down to the earlier period because of the copyright consideration, okay? And uh, some of our important photos are also uploaded, but not everything yet in our heritage library are there. Since we have about 30,000 volumes of books, we just need to prioritize which ones to scan first and to upload. But there are still some books which are in a, poor condition that we cannot start the scanning. It has to undergo um, restoration first before we do the scanning, okay? Just to clarify that thing. Now, for those who'd like to do research in our heritage library, the first thing you would do is to check our catalogs, no? Through our online public access catalog or the OPAC, no? USTLive.usd.edu.ph. Please check uh, the, the materials that are available that are related to your topic. And also, you may browse our catalog of rare books that are available, the ones that I, I presented a while ago. The catalog of rare books about the Filipiniana collections, rare Filipiniana collections, which are published from 1945 down to the earlier period. That's uh, the collections we considered rare. And those rare books, from 16th century, 17th, 18th, 19th century. It's all uploaded in our digital library website. And uh, now after doing that, and you still have some questions, you may email the librarian in charge, me, uh, uh, diana.padilla at usc.edu.ph or dvpadilla at usc.edu.ph or through my colleague, Ma'am Ginaline uh, Santiago, GM Santiago at usc.edu.ph. That's it. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have several questions actually. Now we mm -hmm. have one anonymous att attendee who is asking, uh, what, uh, who determines or how do you determine what will be kept in the heritage library and what will be kept at the archives? Okay. So for the library, we keep published materials such as books, periodicals. Now for the archives, those are the important documents, manuscripts in the university. So that's how we differentiate. And then 
uh, you know, the library, archives, and museums, we share the same mission, the three of us. So for the library, we are keeping published materials, books, periodicals, etc. For the archives, these are the documents, the manuscripts. For the museum, it's more of the artifacts, right? So that's how we differentiate the three. Thank you for that. Uh, there are uh, several books that was, uh, this was actually mentioned by Dr. Eloisa de Castro in our previous Intramuros Learning Session of mm -hmm. number 49. She said that there were several books banned by the Catholic Church and several titles were included in the Index of for Forbidden Books, such as, for example, the Book of Copernicus, which, curiously, is in the collection of the University of Santo Tomas. How do you think the Dominicans were able to procure such a book that was illegal in the first place? Well, these were also donated to us, you know. Uh, of course, the missionaries, the Dominican missionaries, uh, for the evangelization of Filipinos and for the putting up of the college and seminary. It's part of the collections. So now it becomes histor historical. So might as well keep the copy as well. I mean, maybe that time the, the uh, person who donated that to us is ve was very much interested. No? So it's part of his personal collection, perhaps. And then now it was transferred and uh, uh, gave us a gift to UST for the put up of this, uh, the whole now UST. So why not still keep that? Yeah, yeah with regard to the, uh, the manner of procurement, the manner of sec securing the collection, how would you describe the provenance of the materials in your collection? Okay, as for the provenance, um, in our catalog of rare books, you know, we identify the signature on, on a title page. You would see there who is the owner, uh, who donated this book, the, the, how do you call this, the mark, the, the mark on each book, who printed. So those are the things that we considered. Also the notes, you know, some pencil notes or uh, other information written at the back of the title page or sometimes in the uh, inner pages of the book. Uh, in the preparation of our catalog of rare books, uh, before you know, the, the personnel in charge had to check page by page just to see whether there are still important information that has to, to be brought out and describe part of the catalog. So the, the catalog of rare books that we prepared is a descriptive type in which um, the physical condition uh, is uh, described, the size, the how many pages are there, the, the physical condition, the how dilapidated the copy is, and if there are important notes as well coming from the author, or like the one of Jose Rizal with the notes for his friend and uh, for the other donors also, you would see there their signature. So those are the important items that we are considering and describing as part of our um, catalog of uh, historical materials. Well, that is very interesting, the minute details in the book. Now speaking of those small details, found in the pages. Now, is there a risk of loss of information with restoration? And if so, how do we reduce this risk? Well, for the restoration, uh, we're very much careful in doing that. Now, for sure, my, my colleague, Mam Gina, can share more about that. But, you know, we're very much careful because we have to follow step-by-step -step guide. The first thing that we need to consider is the physical assessment. We cannot restore the book right away without doing the physical assessment, meaning we have to check the stability of the ink. Because in the restoration, uh, as you've seen in our video, there's a washing of the page, right? So on our end, it is our responsibility to do the physical assessment and check the ink stability. Because the moment we start washing the page with water, <laughs> Of course, the, the ink might smudge, no? so it's going to be our fault. So we have to be very careful on that and not to commit any, um, any step that would ruin the, the copy. So physical assessment is very much important as we check the ink stability, the size, and uh, check the physical condition. How, what kind of uh, restoration process are we supposed to apply for a particular book? 
is full restoration the only option for conservation? Now, what if, for example, the ink is unstable and there are pencil marks that might have been lost because mm -hmm. of the washing? So, is full restoration the only option or are there other options for people? There are other options for that, no? And there, there's what we call the dry restoration where we just use a chemical to do the cleaning and all. We don't need to, to wash the entire pages. That's why the physical assessment part is very, very important before we undergo the whole 20 steps of restoration. <laughs> Thank you for that. We have a question from Alicia Isguera. Very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. If I may ask, how do you store the digitized copy? Do you use cloud storage or physical servers? Well, now uh, we have the physical servers, but we are planning to uh, transform into a cloud server because of the cost, no? But actually, they're more, more of the same, but the trend now is the cloud storage because having the physical server, you have to, of course, maintain the server itself, and every three or five years, you have to change the server, which is very costly. So we also have plans of now doing the, the cloud server. And let's go to something more financial. Uh, <laughs> were, you a, were you able to appraise the value of the collection? Do we have a specific figure in mind? If so, is the collection insured? Okay. In terms of the pricing for our collection, uh, um, I remember this very well from our prefect, uh, Father Angela Paritio. Only those who put the value of our collection do not know the importance of it. So, I mean, this is priceless. These are treasure that we cannot put any amount on it because it's, I don't know, it's more than, uh, it's more than the treasure. It's more of the, we are holding the, we are keeping the culture the identity of us Filipinos in one library. So for us, it's priceless. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a question from David Sibayan. How is the library, particularly the, your collection? Uh, how, how do you, uh, sorry, i just read this. How is the library, particularly the heritage library books and materials protected during earthquakes and brown? Uh -huh. Does simple change of temperature during brownouts affect the need? For temperature to protect, uh, he's talking about the temperature control. So yeah, yeah. the brownout. Uh, well, for the brownout, we can we cannot do anything on that. No, though we have a generator in the library, but um, it cannot support the whole um, air conditioning units for the heritage library. But we keep the daily monitoring of the temperature inside the room and the humidity level as well. So we have a record of that daily, morning, and then in the afternoon, just to see to it the fluctuation of the temperature, no? And um, uh, going back to... Earthquake. I'm sorry? He asked about the earthquake. Uh, about the earthquake. But uh, we're already working on our disaster management uh, manual for this. But for our personnel, uh, we have assigned people on uh, what to do during earthquake. Per floor, we have assigned uh, staff uh, who will check on this, uh, if earthquake happens or something like that. And um, we're still, we still need to improve our um, process for that one, for the earthquake. But at least it's, it's an earthquake, no, it's not fire. <laughs> because for me, between fire and earthquake, I prefer just the earthquake, not fire, because fire, it will leave you nothing. At least for the earthquake, if it is not that strong, the shelves might move a little, the books might fall, but still the, you can still see the actual book afterwards. No? But for the fire, it's, uh, for me, it's more dangerous. It will leave you nothing. So. But we have to focus also on the preparation of the manual to guide us for these disasters. Thank you for that. We have a comment from Teresita Angsi. Now she's uh -huh. uh, talking about the Inkinabilum, La Laguerra La Guerra La Guerra Judaica. Judaica. It was one of the books brought by the Dominicans from Shaman to the Philippines. Uh, she's clarifying if it was brought from Shaman from the Philippines. And if so, was there an English translation? The provenance of the book highlights the connection between China and the missions. 
to uh, to spread Christianity in China. The Sherlu is especially significant in presenting Christianity in the context of Chinese philosophy. I I hope to include some of these materials at the upcoming conference on 500 years of Christianity. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, for the question, what, do you think the the Revijaika provenance is from China? Uh, it was presented through uh, the Queen Isabella of Spain, and it was printed in Seville in 1492. So uh, on that aspect of China, I, I think I still need to, to check more on that, Pam. Thank you for that. Is the university expanding its uh, heritage library collection uh, to procure volumes outside from outside the university? Is there an effort to increase the 30,000 count? Well, uh, our Heritage Library is also receiving some donations from personal uh, collections of, uh, of uh, private collectors. We have the family of Pichon who donated some important uh, materials like the postcards, you know, the historical postcards printed back in the 19th century and some of uh, the collections of the family, printed collections of the family, and also the Antonio Molina collection. So we are increasing also the collections in the Heritage Library, but we have to check uh, whether these materials are already duplicate, the physical condition, how important the whole collection is before we receive them. But uh, we are receiving donations also. It's uh, very interesting that you presented earlier your six volumes of catalogs from both the Heritage Library and the archives. Now, do you have a separate catalog for, catalog for Filipino and Rare? Yes, we do. The blue copy that I presented. So uh, it has um, the description of all the titles we have about the titles of rare Filipiniana books published from 1940 down to 1610. I think 1610 to 1945. By the way, this uh, set of catalogs, um, if uh, your library or your in institution would like to get a copy of it, just uh, send us a letter because we can uh, provide you with the whole set for the historical uh, catalogs. Mm. Thank you for that. Now, uh, we are wrap up now. Let's wrap up our open forum. Now, be before we end, Last two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your tips for our viewers who have uh, rare books in their homes? Okay. Well, um, if it is only kept in the room or at home, no, or in a shelf like the one behind you, uh, simple as cleaning the book. You open it, perhaps you don't notice and the inner part or the spine, there's already mold. So by checking regularly, cleaning, you would be able to check if there's something wrong on the page. Mm -hmm. Another tip would be if you do not have the proper equipment to do the restoration thing. No? Another is do not situate the shelf near the window <laughs> because the, you know, the heat coming from the sun might affect the pages in a controlled temperature better to to place your rare book depends also how rare the, the copy is if this uh, 16th century copy or what so from time to time keep on checking on it no and um if if this already dilapidated and all uh, you may consult us as well uh, we could provide you some important advice especially with the uh, how to patch in those holes uh, maybe some of the pages are already with warm eaten holes, no? And uh, we do something in the heritage to patch them, but with the use of um, of our uh, pulp paper or the machine. But for the basic, yeah, cleaning and uh, situate your books in a, a temp controlled temperature and not uh, near the window with in which the heat of the sun can really affect the page. So just to clarify, the university library is offering consultation services. Oh, right? 
consultation yes through email we can suggest or also um as i've said in our lumina pandit book we have laid down everything there all the information that you might be needing in case you'd like to have your own conservation uh practices and the digitization as well and we're very much fortunate also with the help of uh, ma'am maronilia maita reyes no ma'am maita reyes who helped us preparing that uh particular article about the conservation of the heritage collections it's all there it's very useful we have a comment from the public of libraries father angela paricio oh said, yes father the guerra du daika was brought from china through the question is how it got to china the same institution that brought it to, the, to china brought it also to the philippines so thank you father for that uh, and thank you for that father uh, very interesting yeah a lot of people are actually asking where the library is. No, we have an answer here. Thank you, <laughs> Norma Alarcon, for answering. So, the UST library is a separate building from the main building. So, baka hindi pa sila updated that the library has yeah. already moved. <laughs> we have our separate okay. building facing the Dapitan Gate. No? <laughs> but the Heritage Library is at the fifth floor yes. of the UST Miguel de Benavides Library. Yes, it's no longer in the main building, guys. Ah, yeah, before it was in the main building <laughs> years ago. <laughs> right. And now, to close this open forum, what is your message for those who wish to pursue a career in book conservation? Okay, well, this is a very um, um, enriching program to learn, especially for book lovers, for librarians. You know, this is a special skill that um, we need to learn to help us, uh, to help us preserve the history of our nation. So, as long as you have the patience, for example, I'm talking about these projects, the conservation, the digitization. As I said, it's a very complex activity. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and dedication. If you are into that then this work is for you. <laughs> so, and also this is part of a library profession. And as a librarian, um, this is a very enriching uh, experience for us to do because we are not just serving our students, but also our researchers, Filipino researchers and abroad to help us improve the excellence in teaching and research and the service to our nation. So, yeah, it's a very nice uh, activities to, to, uh, to do. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Padilla. And that ends our 62nd episode of the Intramural Learning Sessions. I'd like to promote our social media channels. So for more updates on succeeding Intramural Learning Session episodes, feel free to check and subscribe to our social media channels. The Intramurals Administration is available in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And for those who came in late or for those who missed this episode, do not worry because this episode is supported and will be made available in our YouTube channel. And just to promote again our museum collection. So the museum collection of the Intramurals Administration, a lot of them have already been digitized. And it's now available at our page at the Google Arts and Culture page. By the way, Ms. Padilla, do you have a, a channel here at the Google Arts and Culture page? Uh, there we do not have. Yeah. But uh, you may follow our library, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter through USTMDB Line. And also our uh, library website, library.usd.edu.ph and uh, our digital library website, though it's under the and under the USD Library website, you would see there the bottom of the digital library and then the heritage library as well. Thank you for that. And I'd also like to announce that Intramuros is once again nominated this year as Asia's leading tourist attraction. So we won the award last year and we hope to win it again this year. So please help us by going to worldtravelawards.com, create an account, and vote. So this is very important to us here in Tomorrow's and for our stakeholders. And 
to promote our next Intramurus Learning Sessions episode. So this July 30, uh, we are going to have Afsal Azhari from Malaysia. So our topic is about how to balance new development with heritage conservation. And in this webinar, we're going to have a case study, the best practices in Malaysia, uh, Malaysia from uh, from the projects of Mr. Azhari. Right. So finally, Ms. Padilla, thank you for joining us. Do you have any final words to impart to our viewers before we end this webinar? Yeah, well, uh, just to say one last time, no, the USC Live, the University of Santo Tomas, the library, and then the archives, we have received a very um, a, a gift from our library benefactors to do all these uh, preservation things, the conservation, digitization, putting up the heritage library to house our rare collections, publications of our catalog of rare books. So on our end, it is our time to share this, again, this is not only for USD Library. The Heritage Library is our Heritage Library. So thank you so much for listening and for your participation. Thank you so much to everyone who is here with us in this 62nd episode of the Internal Learning Session. We hope to see you again in our next episode. Thank you, everyone, and mabuhay. Thank you. Thank you, John.